there is no slides today, so, um, and there are no notes either, so make your own notes uh, in the the bulletin. Um, so God did an incredible thing last Sunday, I, I, I thought, as we held our first annual backyard uh, barbecue. Such unity. Can, can we bring down our, my sound a little bit low? I have a loud voice, so. Um, uh, I mean, I, I witnessed such an incredible uh, unity, like a weld oil machine moving together, working together from beginning to end from set up to break down, I mean, and, and everything in between, everyone, I mean, literally everyone served and got involved and participated. And no one, I don't think anyone left at the end. Everyone helped clean up too. There were burgers and hot dogs, popcorn, balloons, craft, uh, games, prizes, face painting. We also had raffle uh, uh, gifts as well. So I did sort of like a mental t tally for the day. There were 22 people who came from the church to serve, and we had about 30 guests who came at different time. So that's over 50 folks who, who participate in, in the entire day. And so not, not bad at all. I, I think it was really good. If nothing else, if nothing else, we became one body. I mean, but still, there were a lot of good inter interactions with our, our guests. Uh, I know I saw people having different conversations here and there. So it, it was really a good day. But here's the thing. You know what happens when something good happens? When the Lord does a work in us? You know, when there's a praise report, you know what happens? Someone ain't happy. Do you know who? That's right. The devil, Right? And right after the high, the enemy without fail, without fail, okay, uh, shifts into high gear, right? The enemy will work double shift, triple shift in order to bring the high down to low. And we all know that we've experienced this in ministry, in our lives. And the tactic he uses, especially against the church, accusations, and lies. Accusations and lies. You cannot forget this because when you recognize it, we have to respond. The enemy comes to us with accusations and lies. He's a liar and an accuser. If we do, and if we don't discern, okay, the, the enemy that is lurking among us, we're going to end up falling into his traps and he will divide and conquer. He will. And sometimes, you know, we're family, and family, we don't always get along. We fight sometimes. But thing is, you're not my enemy. I'm not your enemy. You guys are not enemy to each other. We have an enemy, right, that wants us to destroy, who wants to bring down the church. Okay? Um, So here's the thing. A lot is at stake. The future of our ministry is at stake. And so there's something that we have to talk about now. We can't wait. We got to strike the iron while it's hot. And if you look in the bulletin, it says surprise message. It's because it surprised me too. <laughs> Actually, I didn't expect to preach a message today. We were going to have extended time of worship and just, you know, and, and share some scripture to have like a, a Selah or Salah or Sila moment. <laughs> it's, I mean, I, I try to find that the, the right pronunciation. I find all three pronunciations. It's, it's a word that's found in, in Psalms where there's a break, there's a pause. And so I wanted to take uh, the time to just you know, worship the Lord, but this is a message that God has brought forth 
So I can't wait. So, it, and it's, it's a message that's been sort of brewing, brewing in my heart, in my spirit for some time. And so I feel as though with the introduction, we're starting, and, and there's going to be an introduction to Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, E-H- EHS. Today, I need to address this particular thing. We cannot wait. So I didn't know how to sort of title today's message because it addresses three things, like confronting sin, which is probably the major theme, but also avoiding unity buster, (laughs) but also conflict resolution, okay? So anyway, I'm, I'm going to address all these things so that the enemy will not have the opportunity or the chance to, to come in, okay, and undo what God has done. Now, many of you commented tr- during and after the backyard barbecue how well we will work together. And I witnessed that. Many of us did. Great. Praise God. But then right afterwards, I mean literally right afterwards, I began to see enemy infiltrate your town vineyard to undo what God has done. But here's the thing. I'm not addressing, I'm not trying to respond to issues that's specific only to the event. I'm not, you know, this isn't messages coming out of the barbecue event. Rather, things have been visible since I started uh, pastoring here back in January. Okay? I mean, actually, to be honest, these are things that we see in the church everywhere. So I'm going to present hypothetical situations and how we are supposed to deal with them biblically, godly ways. So I'm going to give examples, two scenarios uh, with two persons, no names, obviously, since it's hypothetical, right? Person A and person B. And I'll have to say, this message is really, really important. As Jesus would say, truly, truly, or King James Version, verily, verily, I think. That means, listen up. I have something important to say. And I do have something very important to say for the future of our ministry. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for just such a time uh, engaging in worship, encountering the presence of God. Lord, many of us moved by the Spirit. And Lord, we are just, we're just undone, Lord. We're, we've experienced your love and grace and mercy once again. And many of us in a deeper way than before. So we thank you for that. So we come today with desire to pursue you even more. God, and this message may not be an easy message to preach or to hear. But God, it is for our good that we may mature and grow, continue to minister out of the fullness of your love for us, that we can make a difference in, in, in this place called your town heights and beyond, Lord. So we, we ask that you would humble our hearts and speak to us. And may we receive every word that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as you hear today's message, you might think to yourself, oh, that's not me. Well, think again. Also, please don't deflect and, 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 and start thinking, well, let me, t- I, mean, I know who really needs to hear this, story, uh, this message. Don't do that because if that's you, if, that, if you're thinking that, this message is someone else, guess what? This message is probably for you. So we need to humble ourselves, open our hearts, open our ears, and hear what God has to say. By the way, guys, when I'm sharing... Especially, and I don't know if I've preached any like really difficult messages or challenging messages, but I share these things because I love you guys. God loves you. And you know, and I want us to grow. I want us to do well. I want us to make a a difference in God's kingdom. So know my heart. We're family, right? All right. Scenario one. Person A says something that's true to person B. Something biblical, it, it may be God's word that, that, that person A speaks out. His truth, God's truth. Maybe trying to correct someone's view on something, but speaks without love. 
That is sin, folks. That is sin. Ephesians 4.15. Rather, speak, speaking the truth in love, not just speak truth, but speaking truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. By the way, when I say sin, what that word means, you're missing the mark. Right? When you do what God says not to do, or not do what God says to do, when you miss the mark, that's called sin. In this case, the person A is what? Not doing what God says to do. And also in this case, it's often not what you say, but how you say it. And your voice, tone, and the body language says a lot whether you are actually expressing truth in love or you're expressing it, okay, in judgment and condemnation. So you could say to someone, you know, the Bible tells us that you have to take Sabbath rest. Or you could say, you know, the Bible, the Bible tells us that you have to, you have to take Sabbath rest. Mm. <laughs> First, in love. Second, without love. Do you see what I'm saying? I said the exact same thing pretty much. But we're called to speak truth in love. Also, love is absent when you blurt things out without any knowledge or background or history or story of that person with the state of mind of that person, person B, and you just say st stuff not realizing what's going on. You see, you can prophesy and have all kinds of spiritual gifts and do all kinds of spiritual things, but without love, if you have no love, then the Bible says you are a resounding gong. Did you ever listen to a gong? Wasn't there a show called Gong Show or something like that? Boom, boom. It's loud. It's annoying. Every time it, it goes off, right? If you do spiritual things without love, that's what you sound like. Nobody wants to listen to a gong over and over again. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, that sounds amazing, <laughs> but have not love. I am a noise. No noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith, I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have no love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I del deliver on my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love's supposed to cover a multitude of sins, right? But truth without love can damage and destroy. So before you open your mouth, ask yourself these questions. And maybe this is something you might want to write down. Ask yourself, before you speak to someone, right, in, 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 in a hurry, did I pray? Did I pray? Sometimes we just... We don't think, we don't pray, we just say it, right? Did I pray? Second question you need to ask, is it the right time? Maybe you need to hold off. And, and, and later on, when the time is right, not your time, but God's time, speak it out. Is it the right time? Third question you need to ask, is, do I have the right intention? Are you saying that because, oh, Listen, I, I know Bible, you don't. Is it, you know, what's your intention? Next question is, should I be the one, should I be the one to say this? Maybe it's not your place. Maybe God wants someone else to say this. So you need to hold off. What would Jesus say or do in this situation? And obviously, the last question do I have love in my heart? Scenario number two. Person A offends or sins against person B in other ways. Okay? Other than speaking truth, not in love, but in other ways. It's examples, uh, when you backstab someone, betrayal, cheating, or, or saying something like, you know, gossiping. These are all things that we're not supposed to do. Right? Slandering, cursing somebody out. 
right? And all these things done directly or indirectly. Okay? These are sin against person B according to the Bible. Here's some direct quotes from the scripture. 1 Peter 2.1. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Titus 3, 2. To speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Colossians 3, 8. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Ephesians 4.21, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Corrupting or uh, I, I believe different translation has, has it, uh, no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up. So when you want to talk, say things that's going to build up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So when you speak, is it giving grace? Is it building up? Or are you tearing down? By the way, corrupting talk here, when you look, look up the, the, the Greek word, it's defined as speech that is rotten, useless, corrupt, or depraved. That's corrupting or unwholesome talk. And I would say, and I'm going to step on some toes probably here, one severe and detrimental example of corrupting or unwholesome talk Yes, profanity, obvious. But another is sarcasm. Sarcasm. What is sarcasm? It's an irony, right? Sometimes subtle, often guys under humor, but showing dissatisfaction, mockery, contempt, condemnation, criticism, and blame. It is meant to hurt. I don't care how you, you know, was this sarcasm is meant to hurt in some way. Sometimes we do so often we don't even realize we're doing it. Matthew 12, 36. Man, when I read this, it's like, <laughs> it says, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. So what does the person B do in both cases, scenario one and two? Okay, the examples that I gave. Usually the person B does not confront person A. But instead, we go looking for a third party, which we'll call person C. So we sin in response to sin. Let me explain why that's the case. When you go to a third party or person C instead of person A, directly, no matter how you present it, what you're looking for is validation. You're not looking for a fair assessment. You're not looking for a fair advice because what you say to person C will only make you look good, right? And make the person A look bad, whether a real offense has been committed or not. It's your perspective, which may be accurate or may not be accurate. We go to person C because we want someone else on our side. We need a cheering squad, right? It's our human nature. We want as many people to agree with you. So instead of go, going back to the person directly and confronting, we go tell somebody else. We all do this. It's human nature. And the moment you talk about person A, the person C has now a negative view on person A from a hearsay. This is a problem, isn't it? Especially if, one, there was no real evidence of offense. You're talking about person A when there was no real offense, but now you're telling person C how bad person A is. Let me give you an example. Oh, he looked at me funny. Didn't say anything. No, no good morning, no nothing. Just looked at me funny. What, he doesn't like me anymore? What's going on? 
maybe that guy, you know, the person had a lot on his mind, so he didn't even realize he passed by, passed you by. This is a problem if two, there was no offense, but it was more of a disagreement. Oh, you know, I don't like the, the, the choice of color of the carpet he chose. What, is he blind? Is his, he has no, no taste? He doesn't know how to decorate? Come on. That's not an offense. That's a disagreement. It's a problem if three, the minor offense was exaggerated. Oh, he said hello. But he didn't ask me, how are you? He doesn't care. He doesn't care what I've been going through. What's wrong with him? And four, it's a problem if person A has no way of presenting his or her view because the person B did not confront person A in the moment. Is whatever person B says goes, right? A's not there to say, oh, wait, wait, no, that's not what I meant. No, that's not what. And when you, meaning the person B, goes to person C to share what happened, whether a real offense was committed or not, this is probably the biggest destroyer of unity in the church. Let me say that again. When, when person B goes to person C to share what happened, whether a real offense was committed or not, this is probably the biggest Biggest destroyer of unity in the church. I'm telling you, I've seen it happen too often. So we need to stop. We can't do that. And when you see somebody doing it, stop them. Remind them. We can't break the unity. So then what is the proper way to handle any of this? I mean, there's a, there is a clear instruction in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. And I'm going to read this. Okay. So let's read this um, as we examine, you know, it could be sin issue or dispute, dispute issue, right? Conflict. Matthew 18, 15 says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him. Go and tell him. The person, his fault, between you and him alone. You don't go to somebody else. You go talk to him. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. So, so there's a process. So there's steps that we take. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a pagan and a tax collector. Verse 18, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I'll explain that in a moment. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. If you feel that, that you've been sinned against, go and face okay, the, 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 the guilty person directly. Don't go around. Don't, don't talk to other people. Go directly to confront him. Right? At the moment, if possible, don't wait. Unless God says, wait. That's verse 15. So this means the person B has a right to bring charges against person A. Right? Bring the matter to person A if B, person B feels that we're wrong. And I know, you know, many of us, we, when we confront stuff, we either, wanna, we either fight or we fly, right? Fight or flight. We take off or we, we, we're ready to put, put the gloves on, right? Yes, it's hard to have these kind of th conversations. I understand that, but it has to happen. You don't just walk away and like, oh, you know what happened? That, that guy, uh, I can't. All right? Don't do that. Person, but here's the thing. Person B doesn't have to bring up every single sin done to him. But he has the option to drop the issue, pray regarding the matter, and bear with the person in patience, uh, with patience. Ephesians 4, 2 tells us that. So you can confront, but if you feel like God wants to just... Leave it alone. Bear with the person. Be patient. You have that option as well. 
But that still, you, you, you don't go around telling other people. You don't want to gossip, gripe, retaliate, hold grudge, or hold bitterness. When the offended goes to the offender directly first, and the offender listens, person A listens, and, and here it's interesting, it doesn't say, it doesn't say necessarily repents, but listens. Okay? You gained him because the air is clear between the two of you. Maybe he was wrong, but maybe you were wrong. But if you don't have a conversation, what are you doing? You're leaving it, right? Uh, in a state of confusion or there's no resolution, right? And you don't go to someone else to unload your displeasure. So it's a win-win situation. But what, what, if you, what happens to, you know, what do you do if the person A does not admit his wrong and he has clearly sinned against you? Then at this point, and not before, is first one-on-one. -on -one. Then if, if he doesn't admit, involve one or two additional people to assess the problem and deal with it. That's the next step, right? Because you have to remember, this process is primarily, the, the reason why the process is, is set up is, is an effort to restore the guilty party. We're not out to like punish from the beginning. No, we're trying to restore. That's why the person gets multiple chances, opportunity to, to confess, to repent. And so you bring uh, one or two additional people Right? That makes including you two or three witnesses. Two or three witnesses. So the person A has a lot of opportunities to, to, to you know, confess, right? But when there is a refusal to re, re, uh, repent, even with two or three witnesses, well, then the church gets involved. And when there's still no repentance, then the person is removed from the fellowship and treat it like someone who is, a, who is an outsider, who's not even saved. And when this process is done right, then the heavens recognize as such. God gives a thumbs up. You did it right. You did it well. Okay? That's what bound on earth, bound in heaven, loosed on earth, loosed in heaven means. Okay? And verse 19 tells us that there's a real power in the unity of God's people. If two, just two, agree on anything we ask, he answers, it's done. So in this context of church, church discipline, when, when two come together and agree to do it the right way, do it God's way, then God's involved and, and he honors that. That's what he's talking about. You see how important to maintain unity in the church by the way, this process that Matthew talks about can work anywhere. And, and I've seen like in workplaces, they use this process to, to bring someone, to restore someone. Now, a little bonus revelation to all this mess. <laughs> Verse 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Does that mean if you're alone, God's not there? I don't think so. We use this verse to legitimize that it's okay to have small church. Yes, God, it's only two, th three of us. But God, I know, we know you're here. You're in this prayer meeting. You're in this church. You're in any kind of small meeting, g gatherings. But remember, it's really in the context of church discipline. And so he, God is in the midst of the whole process restoring someone who's gone, ast gone astray, right? Who have sinned. In the Old Testament, you needed two or three witnesses. You see this phrase. Two or three witnesses to bring a proper charge against someone in the court of law. So the phrase two or three is in the context of a legal or financial matters. Quote, unquote, Jesus affirms that he will be divinely present among his disciples as they seek unity in rendering decisions. Which is rightly understood also as an affirmation of omnipresence and therefore of deity. So to properly use this verse really is not to say, hey, God is it's just a couple of us, but God is here. 
no, this is in the context of being in agreement, in, right, in church discipline. So let's try to use that verse more appropriately from now on. I know it's hard. We, we use that all the time, right? Whenever there's small meeting, like, Lord, it's just a small number of here, Lord God, we, but we know you're here. Yes, he is, but in the process of discipline. All right, so why is this message so, so important for us to hear? Well, it's because unless there's mutual submission in the church, unless everyone walks in the fruit of the Spirit, unless loving, we can love one another according to Scripture and able to also confront, confront sin and conflicts biblically, the church will not grow. We must maintain unity no matter what. We are the body of Christ, not body parts. If we're separated, we cannot make a difference or make an impact in the community. And what I see our church, and I, I get so blessed, like we, we know how to welcome guests. When people come, they say, oh, you know, people welcome them, love on them, receive them. But more individually. And just because we welcome people well and love them doesn't mean that we love one another well. We do welcoming others well, but I believe it's time now to love one another as Christ loved us. Without unity, we cannot grow. We cannot mature because we're supposed to work together and serve one another. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Love this uh, passage. I dare for a prisoner for the Lord. This is Paul speaking, right? Urge you to, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. This is what I mentioned before. Eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you're called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There is only one God, one spirit, and there's only one body, body of Christ, that, that is the church. So let me end with a short list of what I believe is required for a revival to happen. You know, people were everywhere. We, God, God, we want revival. We want this place just exploding with people coming. And, you know, we, we, we want that. We pray for that. But here's the, the recipe, if you will, for revival. And this is something else you might want to take down. If we want God to show up in an incredible way, one, we need holiness. We have to be set apart from the world. And this process of confronting sin, discipline, is to bring that person, right, into, back into righteousness and holiness and into fellowship. And, and so also to protect you from not sinning because you've been sinned against and, and you go around telling people but so that you remain holy as well. Second recipe well, uh, forgiveness, we got to forgive one another. One of the biggest issues in the church everywhere is that, I mean, I was shocked. Churches, people, Christians have such a hard time forgiving one another. In the church, other Christians, brothers and sisters, we cannot forgive. But we are called to do that. Third, humility. Humility. We need to be humble before the Lord, and we need to be humble before one another. We're called to, to what? To lower ourselves, to, to consider others better than ourselves. That's what Philippians tells us, right? Can, can you do that? Lower ourselves, lift others up, to not only think of your own interests, but think of the interests of others as well. That's what we are called to do. But also prayer. Prayer. And, you know, this year's theme have been, what? Praying the impossible, right? And we need to continue to, to pray. You know, um, we changed the, the prayer meeting from Wednesday to Tuesday. 
and a little bit earlier from 6.30, 6.30 to 8 o'clock. And you might say, well, I don't know how to pray. That's okay. <laughs> Come anyway. You don't have to pray out loud if you don't want to. Okay. But come, pray with us. You want God to move? We need to pray as a church. And if you don't know how to pray, it's okay. We've done teachings on prayer, how to pray. Uh, we've done the training on, on how to prophesy. I mean, it's, it's, it's just more than, you know, intercessory prayer. We're praying together, sharing lives together, praying for each other, and becoming one in Christ. Again, without prayer, not, nothing we do it means anything. We need to pray. So I want to encourage you to come and pray with us. Hour and a half, once a week. Okay? And a lot of times, I, I, I know, I've been there. You know, 6.30 comes around like, I'm tired. <laughs> I got work tomorrow. But you know what? When you pray, I, I'm telling you, you it energizes you. It gives you strength. And if you, know, if you need prayer, we pray for you specifically for whatever you're going through. And so there, there, there's such a uh, love and, and care for one another. Prayer, Tuesday nights, but also praying Sunday mornings. I, I dream of the whole church, right, coming to prayer. I know that's a small room. But don't let that scare you from, from coming, all right? We'll fit as many people as we can to pray, right? Prayer is not an option. And especially on Sunday, we could do all that we can. Worship, preaching, fellowship, all that can happen. But without prayer, it's our effort. You want God to move? Come pray with us in the morning. It's a little bit of sacrifice because you have to come here a little bit early. But it's okay if you're late. You know, just we're here at 9.40 to 10.10. And then that allows us, imagine if we all came to prayer, right? And all of us, 10.10, we're all here, ready to worship. And people come and we receive them, right? The whole church is ready. And that's what we need. We can... I'm not saying we're going to, but, you know, I mean, we could do acoustic worship. We don't, you know, minimize everything else so that we don't spend a lot of time doing other things, right? We can do that with other uh, or activities on Sunday morning, but we cannot. If I have to cut preaching to 20 minutes, oh, help me, Lord. <laughs> uh, I will, but we cannot. Prayer is not an option. It's not. We want something so big. We want the God's move. We want all these things, but without prayer, what are, we, what are we really doing? I cannot emphasize enough prayer, and last but not least, love. Love. Love for God and love for one another. So we deal with things not way, but I mean, Matthew tells us exactly what we need to do. Because these things, holiness, forgiveness, humility, prayer, love, create unity. These things create unity, and in the midst of unity, I believe revival can happen. I mean, you know what? At the end of the day, revival is, is a God thing. We can't create it. We can't manufacture it. God does it. But if we're not ready, okay, then God can't move. And he can pass us over. God will use whoever, whomever he wants, who's ready, who, who's seeking, who's in the place of holiness and forgiveness and humility and prayer and love. And when you hear of revivals that happen around the world, you see all this. I'm going to tell you, sometimes, you know, I know there's been prophecy and, and things that, that was spoken about the church of some single miraculous healing that's going to bring God's revival. 
Let me say something about that. Revival, I believe, won't come just from a single miraculous healing. Okay? Even if the dead is raised up. <laughs> Why? Because people are funny. We're funny. I mean, we get so used to things, right? It's amazing how quickly we get used to even miracles. Because I don't know if I shared this story. I was at a retreat. This guy had an anointing for growing legs. He pray, prayed for people. He actually prayed for my leg, which was slightly short on the other side. And I had such uh, back pain. He prayed for me. I, I felt the leg grow. My leg became exactly identical. And then my pain literally instantly disappear. And when that happened, people like, praise God. Second person came, same thing. Leg grows up. I mean, you could see the leg grow. You could see it. Second time, people are like, oh, yeah, that's good. Third time, a per legs grown out. Okay, guys? Third time, everyone's like, oh, I, we saw that. So you can't tell me that a single miraculous healing is going to bring a big revival. No, we have to be ready as a church. And without love, without forgiveness, without prayer, humility, and holiness, it's not going to happen. I know this is a tough message to, to bear. But that's the reality. And again, I'm sharing this because I love you guys. I want us to grow as a church, mature in our faith, and to work together and serve together. So, and, and especially when it comes to relationships, right? Because I believe that's what's going to assure, assure in God's move in our midst. Amen? So let's do it together. Next steps. Let's get in the habit of saying thank you. <laughs> Thank you. No, sometimes, you know, yes, we have different gifts and we, we do our thing. But how, when's the last time you said thank you for, for, for someone for serving? Even if that person been doing it for years and, and it's kind of assumed that it's their, you know, thing. My wife has taught me well to say thank you for literally, you know, and I, I try not to do like, you know, fl flipping like, ah, thank you. No, really, thank you. That was great. Thank you for serving. Thank you for coming out when you didn't have to. Thank you. Let's get in the habit of saying thank you, but also in the habit of encouraging, saying things that are encouraging. Let not unwholesome talk come out of our mouth, but let's say, speak things that's going to encourage, right? Lift each other up. Okay.
that you are willing to take now to just stand up on the compound. Thank you. 